Welcome to chapter four of services marketing, the chapter in which we start to really dig deep on what the, cons the customer and the consumer perceives of services. And we introduce one of the really big models uh, and frameworks of services marketing. So this is a chapter that introduces you to Surfcall. And Surfcall exists as two related concepts. It has the five point framework, which we refer to as the RATA framework, and you'll have seen it several times already in the book. And we have the ServQual instrument. So we tend to talk about them as the RATA framework, and then we talk about them as ServQual, where it's the measurement of the satisfaction and the service quality. So what we want to come out of this chapter having thought about is what these five key dimensions of services mean for us as consumers and what they mean for us as service providers. We're starting to transfer your knowledge now from what has my experience been as a customer? So when we talk about things like the zone of tolerance, we're unpacking it from our own personal internal experience through to in when we start talking about Rata, we're talking about unpacking this from the point of view of what is the customer's perception. What are, are we going to be able to do as marketers against these variables? We also have the concept in here which is referred to as the moment of truth, the service encounter, and that becomes an important facet for when we start looking at strategic elements for services, when we start looking at service planning and service design. So, the first thing that we need to appreciate is who is the customer? Now we have external and internal customers when we're doing service delivery. And when we think about the way services exist and have a collaborative element to them. So as you are delivering to your particular key customer, you as an employee are also assisting the service scape and the service environment in which your fellow employees are going to be operating. So if you're working in a retail environment, you're working in a shop setting, your service scape is going to be impacted by your colleagues and your customers. So being able to work together and work in a team, being able to complement and support each other's roles, they become stakeholders in the delivery of a service product. So this is one of the things that complicates services a little bit is that when you're in a supermarket, the products are on the shelf. You can pick the cereal up from one aisle and find the milk on another aisle. But you don't tend to need the two of them to be side by side. We play a little bit with that product bundling, but we don't play a lot. Compare and contrast in services where the people who are serving you need to be working together. So if you're at a bank and there's one teller and a large queue of people, being able to see a whole bunch of people sitting around chatting in the back end of the office doesn't, now they may be doing their jobs perfectly and they're doing their roles perfectly, but it doesn't contribute to the service perception, the overall quality perception. So you need to make certain that you have factored in lines of visibility, customer touch points, and your role as a service provider has internal customers and external customers. It's a little more complicated than just goods. Well, let's look now at one of the big facets here, one of the big measures. So when we're talking about customer satisfaction, we're talking about customer satisfaction as a predictor of customer loyalty. Now we'll talk about relationship marketing in detail and it goes across the course of the semester. But relationship marketing and customer loyalty are related. You want to have a recurring cohort of consumers who buy your services. In marketing strategy, we think back to your ANSOF matrix where we're looking at existing, the question in the ANSOF matrix is, do you have an existing market? Yes or no? If your answer is yes, you have two strategic options. Sell more to those you already sell to, sell a new product to those you already are selling an existing product to. Those 
markets that question the answer off relies on you having customer satisfaction and customer loyalty. No loyal customer means no existing market. So what makes customer satisfaction work? Well, here we're going to look at the service quality. And there are five elements to service quality. We're going to go through those in depth, but the reliability, responsiveness, assurance, empathy, and tangibles. This is the rank order. Reliability is one of the most important factors. Responsiveness is next. Assurance hits the middle ground. And people are willing to put up with services that are reliable and responsive and make them feel that they're okay and that what's supposed to be happening is happening. And they'll trade empathy and tangibility off for reliability and responsiveness. So this is presented here in its priority order. But we talk about it in terms of it being referred to as RATA which is reliability, assurance, tangibility, empathy, responsiveness. The five facets that you need to be appreciating. But on the way to customer satisfaction in these five factors, we have a series of other elements that take place. Now, again, this is a, transit, a transition point for you as a student. Unpack the customer satisfaction list here from your own personal perspective. Start thinking about this as a consumer. What matters to you as a customer of a service? Is it the quality? Is it the price? Is there something specific about the service that matters? Is it how you feel? Do you go to a service to feel good about yourself? Do you feel better like you go to a hairdresser because you're worth it? Do you engage in these services for an emotional outcome? What about the sense of equity and fence? When you go to a service, do you want to be treated as the only customer in the room and the most special person in the entire place? Or do you want everyone to have the same level of experience? Do you want somebody else to be getting a better deal than you are? Or do you want every do you want to be getting a better deal than someone else? So there are these perceptions of equity and fairness that become critical components. We also have the personal and situational factors to which I draw your attention to consumer behavior theory when we start talking about the temporary factors that influence customer satisfaction. The situational factor, the environment, the temporary and transitory elements of how you feel, but there's also the personal factors, your personality, your personal preferences, your prior experiences. So customer satisfaction is a complicated area and we should appreciate the fact that there's still a lot of black box moments where we don't know what goes on in the individual's head because we as consumers don't consciously and cognitively process a lot of the experiences that take place during a service which come together at the end of the decision process as satisfied or dissatisfied or in need of further information. So as I mentioned what's the point of Achieving customer satisfaction, four elements that matter. Loyalty, positive word of mouth. And this is a critical part because services are best explained by people who have experienced the service. Particularly search and credence services are very dependent on reputation and endorsement by word of mouth. The idea behind satisfaction is that it should be profitable. Uh, there's a key point to note here is that you can satisfy the wrong markets. And this is where we talk about market segmentation being critical and this is where we also uh, raise the concept of sacking the wrong customer. If you've got someone who's always showing up at your service but they draw an enormous amount of effort. They make other people uncomfortable at that service and they are decreasing your overall revenue. You don't want their loyalty. You want to dismiss them from your service. So satisfaction should lead to revenue. If it's not leading to revenue, something's gone wrong. You've got the wrong customers. And revenue should increase return to shareholders. But I'd also like to point out that stakeholders as well as shareholders get a run here Satisfied customers mean that you are doing something right. And that something right that you're doing should improve your overall engagement with your stakeholders. 
if people, if you're solving a problem through your service, so you're offering, if you're offering a health service and you've got a lot of satisfied customers, then chances are you've got a lot of people who are healthier and happier. That means that you are contributing to society, you are meeting your broader stakeholders. There's a lot of elements of stakeholder theory to consider that customer satisfaction and happy customers can create. So what is service quality? It's basically a measure of the customer gap. What did the customer expect? What do they receive? And that measure of the exceeded expectations, the perception exceeds expectation, that's their idea of quality. Now I remind you that quality can be negative and quality can be positive. Good quality service is this exceeded my expectations. Bad quality service is this is lower than my expectations. So you're looking at here a couple of critical areas. You're looking at the outcome of the service. So it's the quality of the outcome. You're looking at the quality of the interaction and you're looking at what was the physical environment's impact on the judgments of both of those factors. If you've ever said, well, that person was a, you know, they're really lovely, they're really, you know, really nice person, but the service was terrible, they were hopeless, they were useless, then outcome quality was more important to you than interaction quality. And this is one of the factors that outcome quality is not always the determining factor in service satisfaction. There's a case, uh, and there's been a lot of cases actually in the medical practice where a doctor dealing with a patient, and one of the cases in point was a person who'd had a heart attack, went from calling an ambulance to in hospital, operated on, and effectively their heart attack resolved and dealt with in less than 41 minutes. It set a hospital record. It was a benchmark of perfect outcome. And the people involved complained about the service quality because in that 41 minutes, they were dealt with basically as objects. There was no interaction. No time was spent explaining what was happening. No time was spent explaining what had taken place and outlining the service. Because it was a credence service, the customer felt very much at the end, well, this whole thing had been done in less than an hour. Oh, wow, I didn't get much in the way of treatment, did I? Oh, wow, that's a lot of money I just spent for, you know, 40 minutes. I guess I wasn't, I guess it wasn't serious. Because the service communication broke down and the interaction quality was very poor, physical environment was great, outcome was the best it could be, Interaction quality determined that people felt there was a huge gap between what they're expecting and what took place, and that wasn't resolved. So, mindful that there are three outcome points, and your three outcome points are, or your three quality points are outcome, interaction, and physical environment. Let's look now at the five dimensions of service quality. Reliability is the basically the service doing what it says. And we refer to this as doing what it says on the tin, despite the fact the service is, is decidedly uncanned. Can the service be dependable? Can it be delivered accurately? So reliability is matching back against the idea of inconsistency. It is a measure also though, that you can be completely inconsistent in terms of how the service is performed, because the service is customized, but if the outcome is beneficial each time, then the reliability is still there. Is it delivered dependably and accurately? Assurance is the trust and confidence. So we talk about trust, commitment and reciprocity in relationship marketing. We talk about the idea of the interaction quality. Assurance is part of the interaction. In the medical case, in the medical service, what was lacking was the assurance. The patient was not being reassured that actually they were receiving top quality uh, medical treatment. The reason it was taking place so quickly is because it was a high quality. And even if they were to say, look, 
right now we can take 10 minutes to explain what's going on or get you into the, the surgery right away, you're better off going in straight away. The doctor is ready and prepped for you now. We'll tell, we will give you a debrief afterwards. That's a minute. So that's still nine minutes ahead of schedule. But that minute says, it is more important for us to be reliable and responsive to give you the best outcome than it is for us to be to display empathy and assurance with the assurance factor of we've got this it's under control it's got to move quickly we'll let you know what's happened at the end that is the assurance to inspire the trust and confidence third on the list here is the tangibles so this is where we start talking about service scape remembering that intangibility is a factor that distinguishes services marketing from goods marketing the use of tangible cues, the use of the service, the physical environment, the appearances to trigger quality assumptions. So the tangibility element here is making use of the cues and how this helps people perceive a quality service. Empathy, again this is an interaction element and tangibles was the physical environment quality Empathy is a back on to the interaction quality. When you've dealt with someone and you're dealing with a service, you are effectively a, we know that it's a product offering and you're a revenue unit. That's what business is about. If you come out of a service environment feeling like a revenue unit who was serviced as a product, then you're pretty confident that your empathy scores are down low. On the other hand, if you come out of the service exchange feeling like you were cared about or feeling good about yourself or feeling that, yeah, look, I know I just paid them a bunch of money, but that's not the point. The point is, you know, we got good service out of this. That's empathy. So this is the human touch, the human interaction. It's important, but not crucial. And people will often trade off empathy in exchange for reliability. But assurance and empathy are closely related in that Showing that you care can also assist in inspiring the trust and confidence to say, okay, this is important. We're going to listen. We're going to hear you out. And now we're going to explain to you why we're doing what we're doing. Empathy to assurance will then assist in the perception of the reliability. And lastly is the responsiveness. And I say lastly in this RATA framework because we put this down as the component parts that once you've got a reliable service that can reassure the customer that what's happening in the service is supposed to happen and it's what they're paying for, the physical cues and the physical environments are supporting the perception of the service being reliable and providing the assurance. The human interaction elements are getting people to feel like they matter in the service. The willingness to respond and the promptness and the reaction times become a component to basically link everything back together. Responsiveness deals not just with time, but with customization, with the inseparability. The point of consumption and the point of purchase are going to be together. Responsiveness makes you feel that there is a connection between your presence here and the service being delivered. So it's worth, we put it at the end because it's one of these ones that links together quite nicely and ties the components. Because the router mechanism should be seen as customer, as company-sided view of the customer. We have five facets we can control and adjust. We should consider those five facets and what they can do. So each of these, the router elements are key, car, key component parts to go in depth on. And you can also see a crossover. So you shouldn't think of these as isolated boxes. If anything, they're a five by five matrix. Uh, reliability to reliability can influence empathy, tangible responsiveness, and assurance, and vice versa. You can link everything together. So I want you to have a look at this. What I want you to do with something like SurfQual is that as we start moving through and starting to look at case studies and case illustrations and you're reading the examples in the text to start thinking well and also as you're encountering services 
think about the component parts here. What was it that was important to you as a customer when you went into this encounter? And what's clearly important as a service provider? What mat well, when you're at a service, you look around and say, well, is the service scapes, the tangibility, an important part? You go to a dentist and everything is gleaming like it's the interior of a science fiction uh, set and there's screens there for the sake of screens and everything looks science fiction-ish. Very strong on the service scape, very strong tangibility. At the same time, if you're coming back in here and the appointments are always running late and behind schedule, they're low on the reliability score. If, however, whilst you're in there, you find that the reason they have is that they will prioritize getting the job done right over getting the job done quickly, then the reliability might actually go up alongside the empathy and the assurance. So you've got to look at these factors and you've got to engage with them and say, when I'm dealing with a service, what happens in these five components? Now, Let's bring you a couple of uh, key ideas. The service encounter. We call this the moment of truth. Uh, occasionally you'll hear it referred to as when the rubber hits the road. Basically, this is your point of interaction. This is where the service takes place. Because services are inseparable, the moment of truth, the service encounter, is production and consumption. And if it goes wrong there, it's gone wrong. And there's nothing you can do at that point but recover the service. You can't recall a service. You can't substitute a service. You can't go, well, this service isn't working. Allow me just to swap. I'll just go out the back and get you a replacement one. You can't even do that with a service provider. It's not like you're halfway through getting a filling done at the dentist. And the de so, dentist says, look, sorry, it's just not, you know, I'm not on all firing on all cylinders today. Walks out and tags in the next dentist. These things don't happen. So... Whilst you can do product substitutions with the goods components, you can say, look, this isn't working, I'll swap you. Uh, or this, you know, this drink is flat, I'll get you a fresh one. You can't do similar things with service. So your moment of truth, it is when the service takes place. It's an opportunity to build trust. It uses the five uh, quality metrics, the surf core metrics. You can build your brand identity around this as well. And it's not just the point where pay takes place. It is any interaction. And that's become one of the factors when we start talking about service blueprinting. We want to be looking for these moments of truth. When are you going to have to live your brand values? Now, if we say the brand value of our firm is that we are innovative and we're someone comes into our service environment and it's quite obvious that we're running an old platform. We're running Windows 95 on one of our machines and we're saying, we're the innovators. That's going to create a gap between brand and in that moment of truth of encountering our service scape will be met with, hang on, that doesn't seem right. So you want to be careful with your brand promise, ensuring that it takes place at the moment of truth service encounter. So what do we look at in services encounters? There are four key areas. Again, one of the things about this is that given there are four key areas and there's a lot of research that's been done in this, if you were to want a scenario where you could hit up Google Scholar and look up critical service encounters, service encounter, service encounter adaptability and see what's out there. So there are four component parts that we look at in the broad area. Service failure and service recovery, and we do a lot of work on that discussion of service recovery. The adaptability, which is an applied use of inconsistency. And it's an applied use of your empathy and your responsiveness and your assurance. Coping, this is a service, uh, service role, service element of where you deal, where the employee deals with the situation that's uh, facing them because the employee is a person and people can have a bad day and people and service cu service customers are not always the best people to deal with and employees are the brunt take the brunt of complaints and problems with the service and spontaneity 
this again is making use of inseparability and inconsistency to be able to make use of your employee. It's also about trust, commitment and reciprocity. The idea that you will trust your staff and give them the room to respond. So you're going to deliberately and intentionally up the inconsistency factor to create the room for the spontaneity. So what we'll do to close out the slide deck is briefly talk over these component parts. And when we think about this, we're now thinking from the point of view of service provider. So when there's a service failure, something goes wrong, you are basically looking at a moment where you need to engage on the empathy, responsiveness, and reliability. Reliability has fallen through. Something went wrong, something broke, therefore it's now about what can we do to fix. And in this case, we look at it from a point of, we have to first acknowledge that there is a problem, and that is step one, first admit you have a problem. Acknowledge that there is a problem, then work on saying, what can we do to create the solution? What is the solution that is, and work with the customer. Now, sometimes the problem has come about because the customer has made a mistake. And this is where your empathy comes in, that if you work with the customer to unpack and solve the problem, the customer can realize that, yes, it's their fault, and you can still work with them and gain that loyalty and that extra loyalty by being sympathetic, showing the empathy, and helping unpack what went wrong and how to make certain that doesn't happen again. One of the challenges of services marketing is lawyers, because when something goes wrong, a lawyer's first response is deny everything, admit nothing, wall up and prepare a water type defense to say it wasn't your fault and if it was your fault it wasn't your fault anyway. Lawyers and marketers don't get on in this area. A marketer's response is to say hey there's a problem what can we do to fix it and accept the responsibility and liability. A lawyer's response is to deny responsibility and liability because you're expecting to have to defend it in a court. As a services marketer you don't want to be in a court case over a service failure. You want to be talked about in terms of, wow, that went wrong, but we made it go right. Adaptability, this is again um, this element of saying there is going to be a point where you're going to need, you will always operate within rules, structures, and environments. You always have constraints on you. The universities have a series of rules that guide what I can do in terms of flexibility for assessment tasks, content delivery, and a variety of other factors. But that doesn't mean I can't attempt to accommodate. That doesn't mean that we can't look at your structure and your service rules and your service environment and say, can we make a satisficing? Can we make something that suits? That if we still deliver on the way we were uh, asked to, but we get closer to satisfying, we get closer to your zone of tolerance than we do otherwise. Again, the key here in the adaptability is you're going, this is applied inconsistency. And you may want to use the inconsistency once or twice, and you then want to feed this. If you're frequently finding that you need to use adaptability, this is where a service gap is clearly emerging between the expectations the firm has and the expectations the, com the customer has. Spontaneity, again, this is about reaction. This is the empathy and the assurance elements. But this is also responsiveness. This is about saying, okay, we're in the middle of co-production. We can react. We can do things. We can engage. We don't have to necessarily stick to the script, but we can also listen to our customers and find out their needs and see what we can do to enhance the product offering. Now, one of the case studies of the people who do product spontaneity better than anyone else is Disneyland. Because one of their tricks is about the listening. And their ability to feed information back through the channel. That if you've got someone in a costume, full body costume and a full body suit, they have got the capacity to have the wireless microphone on, to be able to radio in without actually you know, 
noticeably or visibly calling in something, which means that you can occasionally surprise a customer. You find out that someone that's their first time to Disneyland, they've never been there, and you know it's a special day for them, they're celebrating something. You can line up something, you can give a heads up to other park members to say, hey, these people, this group, pay attention to them. We give them a little extra special treatment. Today's a big day for them. That spontaneity is about using innovation, it's about customization, it's about understanding your customers' needs and giving them something extra because you've got the freedom to do that. All right, last box, coping. This is the challenge, and this is the pragmatic element, but this is also one of the things that when we start talking about service role, role stress, service conflict, you as a service provider are still human. A customer comes in and you are going to be performing emotional labor, you've got to be nice to this person, this person doesn't have to be nice to you. There's no requirement on a customer, unless a store has clearly indicated this as a terms and conditions of entry, that they have to be nice to the staff. It's, not, it's always a service with a smile, not consumption with a smile. The key here, and this is where we start thinking about it as how do we deal with this as individuals, you've got to, not, you've got to disassociate yourself, you can't take it personally, you need to isolate and try and bring the customer in to basically minimize the burst area. If you've got a distressed and unhappy customer in a service environment, that's going to impact on the other service. It's going to impact on the other people in the service scape, both staff and fellow customers. But also, if you are able to show the empathy to downscale, to just Someone's coming in, it's been a terrible day for them, it's all too much. This last thing on the service encounter it was just, it was the straw that broke the camel's back. Suddenly, you've got a customer in tears at the um, desk. If you can recover that, if you can show the empathy, you're also demonstrating your brand values to the people around you. And you are demonstrating your service quality to the other customers who sometimes will come to the assistance of a fellow customer to try and help. Uh, de-escalate things. So it's one of these challenging areas because it's a human interaction. It is one of the fundamental flaws of services marketing that you are going to have to deal with people and you're going to have to have coping strategies in place. All right, the last thing to talk about is briefly, I want to mention self-service technology. I want you to look at this in the text. This is really SSTs when we first started talking about these, we were talking about kiosks, ATMs, we are talking about technology in the field. We're now looking at the SST basically as websites, e-commerce, mobile phones, and the kiosks, the ATMs, and the technology in the field. So it's a much broader area than it started. Uh, basically it comes down to the Rata metric. Empathy is a strange beast when we start talking about technology. But empathy exists in user experience design. That if you get an error message that says, sorry, a problem occurred, would you like additional help? That's a display of empathy rather than error 5072. So you want to be thinking about this in your design of your service technology experience. But basically, reliability is technology gets the job done. Responsiveness is that it does the job quickly. Assurance is that it has the indicators that when you've pressed a button, something happened. When you submitted a form, that it actually went somewhere and things took place. That the tangibles are also then the physical components. So if you walk up to an ATM and it's cracked, the keypad's dirty, the screen's flickering, and you're pretty certain something's taped on the side of it, you're most likely to walk away from that machine because the tangibles are giving you the cues of everything is wrong with this. In contrast, if you walk up to something, it's covered in chrome, it's shiny, it's reflective, you are going to trust that machine because that machine looks right. So you want to be looking again at your surf qual, your writer elements. The last part though is you want to be looking at with self-service technologies is can you bring in recovery adaptability? Can you bring in spontaneity and coping? 
does the software need to cope? Do the servers and the technology have points where they have coping mechanisms because there's ex excessive strain on the network? Are there component parts where they need to be using, you need to be thinking about coping for your technology? So that wraps the chapter. This is one of the ones which is a big solid domain of content. There's a lot of stuff in here. It may take you two or three passes of the chapter to get your head around all of it. It's certainly one where there's a lot of external material. Surfqual is one of the best researched pieces of marketing technology that we have. It's a robust and reliable tool. The Rata framework is very solid. And Surfqual is the companion to the gaps. You look at the gaps, you look at Surfqual, the Surfqual protocol was designed to measure and identify in a quantitative manner the gaps that exist in the gap model. The gap model was designed to have the theoretical and conceptual manner to think about how do we resolve the problems that Surfqual has identified. And that's a wrap for the chapter.